Hey there, I'm Sarah A. Chrisman, the author of The Tales of Chet Samoka, and today I'm going to read you a short little scene from book seven of The Tales of Chet Samoka, Sparks Press. This is the one where Felix, this is the scene where Felix goes to interview Ethel about the upcoming eclipse. And since we've got another solar eclipse coming up soon, I thought it might be fun to revisit it. Now, at the point at which I'm going to start reading, Ethel's pet owl, Athena, has just stolen Felix's hat. He's not really happy about this. You live with that thing? Felix asked incredulously. Ethel's head jerked back in surprise. She frowned, then adjusted her spectacles. She's my pet. She's a flying demon. Felix watched as the owl held down his hat under one foot and used her beak to viciously tear off strip after strip of the thin woolen fabric. She tossed these to the left and right with reckless abandon. She is not, Ethel protested. She's a sweet little deer. She just doesn't like hats, that's all. She'll grudgingly tolerate them outside the house, but not inside. Felix eyed Athena warily. Anything else she doesn't tolerate? Raccoons, dogs, and birds bigger than herself, Ethel listed promptly. Felix shook his head and looked at the owl. Already, the patent leather brim of his cap was, only was its only recognizable remnant. You know, I've eaten chickens bigger than her. So has she, Ethel told him, oblivious to his implication. A bit at a time, of course, but quicker than you might expect. Addie likes to say that though she be but little, she is fierce. That does sound like something Addie would say. Felix cast one last regretful look at his thoroughly destroyed hat before getting down to business. I came to ask you about eclipses. Ethel brightened. Ah, yes, Tuesday's event. It should afford a very exciting opportunity for resolving some of the great questions about the solar corona. Felix was already out of his depth. He knew corona as a synonym for crown, but what a monarch's head decoration might have to do with the sun, he really had no idea. Before he could inquire into the matter, though, Ethel happily launched into a complicated monologue of technical jargon. She chattered away in a more confident and animated fashion than he'd ever before associated with awkward Ethel, and he understood approximately one word out of every ten which came out of her mouth. From the little he could understand, he gathered that the university down in Seattle was sending a team of professors to California to view the eclipse. He made sure to get their names, Names are generally a good way to sell newspapers, since humans are generally vain and people like to see their own names and those of their friends in print. He switched from his usual shorthand to longhand to write down the names so he'd be sure to get all the spellings right. Then he looked up from his notepad. Why are they going all the way down to California? There's a perfectly good observatory at the University in Seattle, isn't there? Ethel adjusted her spectacles. Then she made a statement which was both sensible and comprehensible, a novelty for a statement from Ethel. It's less likely to be cloudy in California than in Seattle. Ah, of course. Felix wrote this down, feeling sheepish. Eclipses don't happen very often, you know, Ethel told him pointedly. She spoke as though she had suddenly realized she was dealing with a simpleton. The team wants to make sure to take full advantage of it. Of course. At this point, Athena grew bored with destroying Felix's hat. She flew back up onto Ethel's shoulder. Ethel was wearing a deerskin bolero jacket over her shirt waist. It had struck Felix as an unusual and aggressively western garment, but no stranger than anything else about Ethel. Now he realized that the jacket's purpose must, he, must be to protect Ethel's shoulder and the rest of her clothing from the owl's sharp talons. Pretty bird. Ethel crooned and petted Athena's chest. Good bird. Athena settled herself, and Ethel turned her attention back to Felix. Either she had already forgotten her temporary resolution to speak to him in very simple terms, or reducing her speech to layman's lingo seemed like, seemed like too much trouble. She went on, They'll be using one telescope with a four-inch Clark refractor, and another with a three-inch French lens and an Asimov mounting. How do you know all this? Felix asked. He jotted down two telescopes, one French lens. I've been corresponding with Professor Pritchett. He's in charge of the expedition. Do professors always keep up with their alumni after they graduate? Felix asked curiously. 
His own teachers had always seemed glad to see the back of him, but maybe things were different for college graduates. He asked me to convince my father to make a large financial contribution to the expedition, and I did. Money opens doors, Felix reflected ruefully, or in this case, keeps them open. He asked Ethel what sort of things the general public could expect from the eclipse. It will get very dark, Ethel told him, switching back into her addressing a simpleton tone. She moved her finger up and down on Athena's chest, first fluffing, fluffing up her feathers and then smoothing them. Athena here will probably like it. What about other animals? How will they react? Ethel shrugged, which made Athena flat for balance. The ways they usually react to sundown. Cattle and horses will think it's night and seek shelter. Chickens will make their usual evening calls and then go home to roost. Felix jotted down this information. Athena directed her sharp-eyed focus towards his darting pencil. She raised her head, then lowered it. Then she leaned forwards. Suddenly, she launched herself off of Ethel's shoulder. The next thing Felix knew, his bare hands were grappling with nine living razors in the form of Athena's talons and beak. The owl won. Victoriously clutching Felix's pencil in her talons, Athena flew to a high shelf on the far side of the parlor and settled atop a plaster bust of Minerva. If this keeps up, I won't have any possessions left by the time I go home, Felix thought regarding his stinging, aching hands. They were crisscrossed with bloody lines, and possibly no hands left either. He glared over at Athena the owl, sitting on an effigy of Athena the goddess. I thought that perching on pallid busts of Pallas was supposed to be reserved for ravens. In a grumpy aside to himself, he muttered, That was one of my good pencils, too. It was an especially small one meant to be tucked into a lady's aid memoir. He always felt awkward buying new packages of them since they were mostly used by women, but they were very convenient to carry around in a pocket. Ethel sighed and shook her head. Athena, she said in a mild, chiding tone, I've told you it's very naughty to steal pens and pencils. People need their writing tools. Athena switched the pencil from her foot to her beak and issued a series of high-pitched, triumphant sounds in rapid succession. Ethel shook her head again and approached the owl. Will you give it back? She took hold of one end of the little pencil and tugged. Athena clamped down her beak and dug her talons into the plaster bust on which she was sitting. Ethel tugged harder. Athena clamped down harder and let out a defiant squeak. Mine. Ethel sighed and let go. I'll give you a new one, she told Felix. I'm sorry, she might hold it that way for hours before she gets bored and throws it away. Until then, she'll let it break before she lets it go, and then it's no use to anyone. Felix wrapped his handkerchief around one bleeding hand and looked ruefully at his other bleeding hand. Do you have a spare rag somewhere? Ethel squinted at his hands. Ah, yes, of course. Sorry. She disappeared from the parlor, then returned a moment later. She handed Felix a tattered mass of cloth that looked disturbingly like it had been part of a woman's undergarment before it had been consigned to the rag bag. He tried not to think about this as he tied the scrap around his hand. Come up to my bedroom and I'll give you a new pencil, Ethel told him matter-of-factly. Felix stared at her. You can't be serious. Ethel frowned quizzically at him. Athena took yours, I owe you one. And with no further discussion than this, she moved out of the room. She left the door open behind herself, clearly expecting Felix to follow her. Felix looked at the open door, then at the vicious owl who was still sitting atop the war goddess. It's just us here now, alone, together. She glared at him balefully. He followed Ethel. As he mounted the richly carpeted stairs, he imagined his own obituary. Died, Chetsumoka, December 26th. Felix Adam Halloway of this city shot by Frederick Hauser after Halloway was found alone with Hauser's daughter in her boudoir. Felix glanced down at the bit of torn something which Ethel had given him to wrap around his bloody hand. To the obituary he was writing in his mind, he added, a jury found the shooting entirely justified. He reflected that at least he'd had a good life while it lasted. He wondered if Ken's mother would come to the funeral. When they entered Ethel's room, all these grim thoughts of his own mortality immediately fled from Felix's mind. He was suddenly too busy turning pea-green with envy at what he saw. On Ethel's desk was a gleaming beauty of a typewriter. 
Square keys with nickel and glass bearing the letters of the alphabet curved in a gentle arc in the open front of the machine. The typewriter's body was covered with intricate Baroque flowers. Atop the machine, a gleaming bell was arranged behind the cylinder that held the paper, and below the cylinder, a filigreed nameplate proudly bore the manufacturer's name of Crandall. Not often I see one of those in a private home, Gibbs reflected. What does a girl like Ethel even use a typewriter for, he wondered. Letters, I suppose. Papers, maybe, when she was still in school. He looked down at his battered but perfectly serviceable little notebook, then glanced back at the fancy enamel typewriter. Using such a complicated machine to write correspondence and short essays seemed a bit like using a hatchet to break open eggs. And the typewriter wasn't the only expensive toy in the room. A bright brass telescope, gleaming like gold, was set up by the window. Next to this, a large bird cage was a large bird cage holding a driftwood perch. The bottom of the cage was lined with newsprint, and shredded newsprint was scattered over the floor all around the cage. Felix recognized the torn remnants of some of his own articles. He ruefully thought back to his boyhood dreams about newspaper work leading to undying fame. Ethel broke into his dreary thoughts by giving him a pencil from a drawer in her desk. Here you go. She paused, adjusting her spectacles, then said absently, The hat. She opened a chatelaine pocket that was lying atop her dresser and took out a dollar. Will this cover it? Very adequately, thank you. As long as I don't catch pneumonia going home bareheaded, he added ruefully within his own mind. The same thought seemed to occur to Ethel when she glanced out her window at the snow falling heavily outside. She frowned, then told him, One moment. She left the room, then came back carrying a battered old boss of the plains hat. Its broad brim curved upwards at the sides from all the use it had seen. Pa had put this on the charity pile, Ethel explained. Will it fit you? Even if it doesn't, it's better than nothing. Felix tried on the hat and was pleasantly surprised to find it a near-perfect fit. Admittedly, he almost laughed aloud at his own reflection when he saw himself in the mirrored door of Ethel's armoire. With his cyclist's tan and his pugilist's muscles, in a hat like this, he could have passed for a cowboy. Well enough, thank you. Will you want it back? Ethel shook her head. Not necessary. Thank you again, then. You're welcome. While they were still out of attack range of Ethel's overzealous avian chaperone, Felix took the opportunity to ask the lady some more questions about eclipses. He jotted down her baffin bafflingly technical answers, resolving to decipher what he could of them with the aid of a dictionary and an encyclopedia when he got back to the office. Then he hurried out of Ethel's boudoir before her father could get home and catch him there. Felix had gotten into a lot of risky scrapes in his career as a journalist, but he never imagined that this particular assignment would be so hazardous. When he was downstairs, he took care to put away his newly acquired pencil and remove his hat before entering the parlor again. Athena was still perched atop her namesake's bust. She still had Felix's old pencil clamped firmly in her beak, and she glared at him as if daring him to take it back. It's mine now, she seemed to be saying. I killed it myself. Felix awkwardly pulled on his gloves over his bandaged hands. As far as he concerned, from now on, what the owl caught, the owl kept. Ethel followed Felix into the parlor. Athena, she called and patted her shoulder. The owl obediently flew over and perched there like a dog coming to heel. She still hadn't let go of Felix's pencil, though. Good girl, Ethel cooed. She petted Athena's breast feathers and tried one more time to pull the pencil away from her, but without luck. Athena let out an angry squeal right next to Ethel's ear. Ethel winced at the loud, high-pitched tone and sighed and shrugged. Sorry, Felix. I tried. It's all right. Thanks for the new one. Athena directed her piercing gaze towards Felix. The owl raised her head and lowered it again, staring at Felix all the while. It's not over, the bird seemed to be saying. Felix hurried nervously outside, wondering if any man would ever succeed in running the gauntlet of Ethel's bizarre household. He'd like to meet the man who would dare court Ethel Hauser, let alone be successful at marrying her. Felix tried taking the bandages off of his hands when he got back to the newspaper office, but for a few hours the deep gashes kept reopening. They were far from the most painful injuries he'd dealt with in his life, and he knew they'd stop seeping by morning, but it was still vetedly annoying to keep trailing blood all over his copy as he tried to write his article. When it was finally done, he scanned it one last time and felt a quiet pride that he'd done a good job despite the strange challenges he'd faced. He congratulated himself that now the whole town would be ready to get the most enjoyment possible out of the rare total solar eclipse on Tuesday. 
It snowed all day Tuesday, and nothing in the sky could be seen through the clouds.